Okay. Uh, now let's put all our knowledge into some use. We are going to construct an instrument we call as the moving coil galvanometer. So this instrument can be used to measure the current and the voltage in a circuit. Slight adjustments, we will talk about it a little later. But the basic construction of the instruments, the moving coil, the coil of the galvanometer uh, is going to be done like this. This instrument will have a permanent magnet, okay? like it's in the, in the shape of a circle, you see, to maintain the field at a constant value. So it is in the shape of a circle and you have a soft iron core, okay? just a soft iron core on which you have your coil wound around that soft iron core. Well, you use soft iron because if you keep hard iron, uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, then it will easily get, uh, it can get uh, magnetized and it won't lose the magnetism. Okay. So, particularly uh, if you are using a coil, the coil will have magnetic field and uh, you know, that can magnetize that, uh, uh, magnetized iron. So, you are going to use soft iron code, which means that it won't retain the magnetic field once the current is switched off or it will retain only a very small amount of magnetic field. So that's the reason you are going to use soft iron for all your uh, electrical equipments, uh, measuring equipments and, and then all the other places too. So you have a soft iron core and you have a winding the coil wound around that. So you have a permanent magnet, a soft iron core and a coil wound around that. You are going to pass current through that coil. So what is going to happen now? You, you are keeping a coil which is carrying current in the presence of a magnetic field. So that coil is going to experience a torque now, both sides, it will you know, experience forces, so you will experience a torque. So this coil is going to turn. If you don't do anything else, then what, what will happen is, as we discussed in the previous video, this coil will keep oscillating. Okay, uh, you don't need that. So what you need is how much it deflects. So that can be found by using a, a spring, a spiral uh, spring that is connected to the soft iron core and then to the bottom, the body of the, the meter. So when the coil tries to turn, then this spring will pull it back. It's a torsional spring. It's not a linear spring. It's a torsional spring. It's more like a, a mosquito coil. Okay, it's like that. So when you're trying to pull one uh, side or one end of the coil, then it's going to tighten. If you can notice, it'll try to oppose that motion. So as this tries to move, then the coil will try to pull it back. So at some point, the torque of that coil and then the uh, torque produced by this magnetic field on this current carrying uh, uh, coil, I mean the torque on the spring and the torque on the coil would match, then it will come to an equilibrium condition. So it will just deflect and then as it keeps deflecting, it keeps pulling, the spring keeps pulling the coil. And then at some point, it's going to be equal. So the torque on the coil and the torque on the spring would be the same. So then it will stop. Okay. So now you can find the deflection. If you pass more current through the coil, then the coil will experience a greater torque. So it will try to go further, but then this spring, the torsional spring, will try to pull it back. As it tries to pull it back, and you will find another equilibrium position. So, depending on the current that is flowing through the coil, it is a, a the the torque experienced by the coil would be different, as you know, and it's going to be balanced by the torque from the spring. 
So at some point they will reach equilibrium and it will stop. Okay. You are going to see the deflection too. So you have the pointer at the null position here. Even though there is no current flowing through it, then you, you, the pointer will point here. Then as it moves, then the pointer will move in this direction. Then it will stop at some place. Then you can read. So this is a basic structure. Okay. Now let's see how to how to calculate. The current, the, uh, the, the current okay, that's flowing through the coil. What is the relationship between this deflection and the current flowing through the coil? And that is what we would see now. Okay? So the condition for this is that the torque produced by this magnetic field on the coil must be balanced by the spring that you are attaching uh, to the coil and the body. So it won't allow you to move too much. Uh, so this torque, torque on the coil, I call it as tau C, is equal to Mb. This we know. What does this M? It's mag M is magnetic moment. Okay, what is the magnetic moment of this coil? So it is, as we've seen already, it is N A I. So N is the number of turns in the coil and then A is the area of the coil, you are seeing it from the top here. So NA and then I, I is the current through the coil into B. B is the strength of the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. Now what is the torque on the spring? So that I call this to Yes, so that's going to be on the spring. Some the spring constant k. This is a torsional spring constant. Okay, I told you the spring is more like a, a mosquito coil. Okay, so as you pull the one end, then it's going to tighten. Okay? It's like that. So this this is not a linear spring that we have come across before, right? So yes, you, it's going to be kx, but now it depends on the angle. So K is five. Let's see angle. So this is the torsional spring constant, and phi is the angle of deflection. Normal spring, the linear spring, will give you Kx. That is the spring constant K multiplied by the distance x. Here the equivalent of distance is the angle. So this is a torsional spring. Okay. So K. Like this, like a mosquito coil. So these two must be equal. So which means that K phi is equal to N A I B. So phi can be calculated as N A B by K into I. So this is a relationship between phi and I. You see N is the number of turns. So once you designed this instrument, the number of turns cannot be changed. Then A, the area of the coil, that also cannot be changed once you, once you have the instrument in your hand. So you cannot arbitrarily change the area. So that's fixed. Then B, the magnetic field, again, that cannot be changed because they are permanent magnets. Okay, you cannot pass current and then change the magnetic field strength here. Okay, they are permanent magnets. So B cannot be changed. K again the spring constant. So that also cannot be changed. So, so none of this, these quantities can be changed. So this is a this all these quantities in the brackets are constants. So you know then that phi has a linear relationship with phi. So as the current increases the angle will increase linearly. So for 1 ampere it is 10 degrees, and for 2 ampere it will be 20 degrees. And for 3 ampere it will be 30 degrees. So will, the angle will change uh, linearly with the current. So this is going to be linear scale. So this is how the moving coil galvanometer functions. So you, you send current through the coil 
maybe you have bash rate something, you send current through the coil, and uh, then you're keeping the coil in the magnetic field. Now it's going to deflect. So it's going to experience the torque as we've discussed before. And now you are going to use a torsional spring to pull that pull it back. Okay? You will not allow it to do these oscillations that we talked about yesterday. If there is no spring constant, then it will keep oscillating, as you said. Okay, now it won't do that. Because as it tries to move, then you're trying to hold it. You're pulling. Okay, now we will talk about what is called as the current sensitivity of the moving coil galvanometer. We know this expression, we derived it. Phi is equal to N A B by K to I. So the phi is the angle of deflection and I is the current flowing through the coil. We also say that phi, the angle of deflection of the galvanometer is proportional to I. We said that. So if the current increases in the galvanometer, then the deflection will be more. So this is measured in degrees or radians and this will be in amperes. Okay, so you have this expression. So the current sensitivity is how many degrees or radians does the galvanometer deflect for a unit current. So that is called as the current sensitivity of the galvanometer. So uh, how do I do that then? So this is how many degrees per unit current. So this is called as the current sensitivity. From this equation I will get phi by I is equal to N A B by K. So how can you increase the, the current sensitivity? So what is it? Let us try to understand this uh, a little more. The current, for a particular amount of current, you know, you, the galvanometer can deflect say 10 degrees or 20 degrees or 30 degrees, 40 degrees. If it deflects more, then we say for a particular amount of current, the current doesn't change. Okay? I have three galvanometers, one galvanometer deflects I send a certain amount of current, say 10 microamperes or something. Then the first galvanometer deflects to a certain uh, angle. And then the second galvanometer deflects to a different angle. So the first one could be 10 degrees, second one could be 20 degrees for the same 10 microamperes. And the third one could be 30 degrees for the same uh, 10 microamperes. Which is more sensitive to the same current, or which is the most sensitive? to the same current. Clearly, the one which deflects 30 degrees is the most sensitive of all the three. Because you are sending the same amount of current, but the deflection is more. So, the precision could be more. Uh, if the deflection is less, then the precision will be less. If the deflection is more, then the precision of the instrument will be more. So, the third instrument, which deflects 30 degrees, is considered to be the most current sensitive galvanometer. Okay? So, if you want to increase the current sensitivity, then this is what you need to do. Well, you can either in increase the number of turns in the coil, then angle will, this term, this term will become bigger. Okay? This, this number, this quantity will become uh, a bigger quantity actually. Or you can increase the area of the coil. Or you can increase the strength of the magnetic field. You can have more powerful uh, permanent magnets in the galvanometer. Or you can use a weaker spring because the spring is providing the counterbalancing torque. We saw that. So if you have a weaker spring, then it will deflect more. If you have a stronger spring, then it will deflect less. So by controlling all these uh, factors, uh, you can increase the increase or decrease the current sensitivity of the galvanometer. Okay. Uh, okay, so there is 
Clearly, once we talk about current sensitivity, then there can be another quantity called the voltage sensitivity, right? So I've talked about the current. If you have a galvanometer, if you have a galvanometer here, okay? So if you send a certain amount of current through that, then it's going to deflect. Again, then the question could be, clearly you connect it to your battery, right? So battery. Yeah. So that would send the current. I'm just saying. You know, like there would be some amount of uh, a voltage drop across the galvanometer because the galvanometer will have a resistance to which I call this RG, RG. And then if we connect the battery B across that, then the voltage drop IG into RG should be equal to V. So the current through the galvanometer multiplied by the resistance will give you the voltage across the galvanometer. So, for that voltage, how much does the galvanometer deflect? Same, current sensitivity, when current flows, the galvanometer deflects. As, a as current flows, there is also a, a, a voltage drop across the galvanometer. If there is a voltage drop across the galvanometer, then you can find the, current, the voltage sensitivity too, along with the current sensitivity of the galvanometer. So, how do we do that? Okay, then the current sensitivity, the voltage sensitivity will be the voltage sensitivity voltage sensitivity is the deflection of the galvanometer per volt, per unit voltage and that is the voltage sensitivity ok, then can I, can I get this from here? yeah, I can you see, this V, the voltage across the galvanometer, is given by I into the resistance of the galvanometer. So I can write this as phi by I into R G of the galvanometer. Okay? But you know what phi by I is, right? It's NAB by K. So this is given by N A B by K into RG. Okay. So this is a voltage sensitivity. Now you have an extra term RG there. Okay. Think about it this way. If you want to increase the voltage sensitivity, then I need to clearly use a low resistance coil. Okay. And uh, I can also use a low resistance spring. Uh, so the spring of weaker strength. Okay, I can use that, and I can I can also uh, increase the uh, strength of the magnetic field. I can do that. But what about these two things, N and A? N and A. Well, if I increase the number of turns then I am increasing the length of the conductor. If I increase the length of the conductor, this resistance, the resistance of the coil will not remain the same. So this will also increase. If you increase the number of turns, this will also increase. So it may probably result in, in reduced current sensitivity also or even if it increases current sensitivity it is not going to in, I'm sorry if it increases okay let me take it back but let's look at these two quantities N and A if I increase the number of turns then the length of the conductor increases if the length of the conductor increases, then the resistance of the galvanometer also increases. So if this increases, Rg can also increase. It depends on how much Rg increases as you increase n. So your voltage sensitivity may suffer. We know this. If I increase the number of turns, the current sensitivity will increase because there is no resistance component there. But the voltage sensitivity 
need not increase it may even decrease or even if it increases it need not increase in the same proportion because as this increases then rg also increases if rg the increment of rg is smaller compared to the increment of uh, the number of turns then the voltage sensitivity will increase but not proportionally because this doesn't remain constant as this increases as this increases this also increases so there is a you know it it, it need not be uh, a straight line increment in some cases it can even decrease because you increase the number of turns you are increasing the resistance then if it has increased the resistance the voltage sensitivity even come down if this increases more than this then this will come down okay if so when you improve the current sensitivity you are you, you you by increasing the number of turns you can never be certain that the increase in number of turns will increase the voltage sensitivity this is something that you need to understand and the same thing is true for the area well if the area increases what would you do you know you, you may probably end up having a, a longer coil conductor right as area increases so if you have a longer conductor then what your argument that we have for the number of turns will be applicable to a also so if there is an increment in area there will be an increment in the length of the conductor for the most part okay unless you change the structure okay uh, you you're converting uh, a square coil into a, a a circular coil or something okay then it, it you may increase area but even that has a limitation but without increasing the um without increasing the uh, uh, the conductor length but even that has some limitations okay but the idea is that in the normal sense if you increase the area you will increase the length of the conductor also if the length of the conductor increases then the resistance will also increase so the voltage sensitivity need not increase if the increment is proportional then even after you increase your area this may remain this may remain the same the voltage sensitivity may remain the same or it may increase but not proportionally or it may even decrease depending on how what kind of uh, material you are using for the coil so this is something that you have to understand so increasing current sensitivity need not necessarily increase the voltage sensitivity particularly when you peak with n and a if you handle b and k yes it may increase will definitely it will increase because that you are not touching them so or is not going to change so this will remain constant these two things remain constant so as you change then it can be a proportional increment can Uh, hope this is clear so we talked about current sensitivity and also voltage sensitivity and uh, we know that increment in current sensitivity need not necessarily result in voltage sensitivity increase the number of turns will increase the current sensitivity but that need not result in voltage sensitivity it may but that's not certain depends on other factors too depends on the resistance of the coil hope this is clear to you welcome back students in the previous video we talked about the moving coil galvanometer the moving coil galvanometer is a simple instrument which has a coil it's kept inside the two poles or it's kept between the two poles of a permanent magnet and if current flows through this coil then the coil will deflect and if you attach a pointer up to the coil then the pointer will also deflect along with the coil and we saw that the the deflection angle phi was proportional 
to the current which is flowing through the coil. The galvanometer is a very sensitive instrument. Even for a very small amount of current, the reflection could be more. Typically, when you design a galvanometer, you design it to, to handle current in microamperes. For example, I may design a moving coil galvanometer that would handle current of up to say 20 microamperes. So the current, the maximum current my moving coil galvanometer can handle is 20 microamperes. Clearly, you have a coil there, it's a conductor, and it also has resistance. So the resistance of the galvanometer could be taken to be, say, 50 ohms. I'll call this as the resistance of the galvanometer RG, is 50 ohms. And you have the scale on the galvanometer, and a pointer that will point to zero when no current flows through this. And it will have a full scale deflection. A full scale deflection here for current of 20 microamperes. This is how I have designed this galvanometer. So for no current, no deflection. For 20 microamperes, it will show you full scale deflection. For any value between 0 and 20 microamperes, then the pointer will point at some other angle. And we know that the angle of deflection, phi, is proportional to the current. So this is what we derived in the previous video. Okay. Now let's see if we can use it, you know, in a circuit, okay. Let's suppose I have a battery one, volt, this is a one volt battery, and let's suppose that it's connected to your resistance of, say, one mega ohms, or one into 10 to the power six ohms. I can calculate the current to it. So the current I through the circuit is going to be V by R and that should give me 1 micro ampere. So my I now is 1 micro ampere. So this one microampere is within the range of 20 microamperes, the, the maximum current the galvanometer can handle. If it is more than that, if it is more than 20 microamperes, the galvanometer will get damaged. So I can pass current from 0 to 20 microamperes in the galvanometer. If there is no current, if it is 0 amperes, then the pointer will be at the 0 position. 20 microamperes, the point will show me the full scale deflection. But now I have only 1 microampere flowing through the circuit. So, I can connect this galvanometer okay. This is a galvanometer. Okay. And this will also have some resistance. As the current flows through the galvanometer, so I'll call this as RG. RG is the current flowing through the galvanometer. Now, I said it's 50 ohms. Yes, RG is 50 ohms. But would it impact? Because if there is 50 ohms, then there will be a drop here, voltage drop. 
across the gamma magnitude too. But would it impact it too much, the circuit? No, because you have one mega ohms here and you are connecting only 50 ohms in parallel, uh, in series to that. So the total resistance of the circuit hardly changes. So you will have, you will still have almost one microampere flowing through the circuit. But one advantage of connecting this galvanometer there now is that it will show you the reading directly. It will show you that, okay, it's 20 ohms and it will show you a 5% deflection. Then you can read it. So you are using it as an ammeter. It's, what is an ammeter? An ammeter is an is, is, is instrument that allows you to measure the current flowing through the circuit. So the galvanometer can be used as an ammeter now for currents which are very, very, very small in amount. See, it's so 20 microamperes. Suppose I am going to increase the voltage or reduce the resistance. If I do this, if I increase either this or the, uh, reduce this, the current in the circuit will increase. Let us say that I am going to increase the voltage to increase the current in the circuit. I can do it either way. But I am going to increase the voltage. If I make it 2 volt, then 2 microampere current will flow through this, approximately. If I increase it to 3 volts, then 3 microampere current will be flowing through this. If you increase it to 20 volts, then 20 microampere current will be flowing through this. But if you increase it to 30 volts, then I am in trouble. Because the current through the circuit is going to be 30 microamperes, but my galvanometer can handle only 20 microamperes. If it's if it sends more current than 20 microamperes through the galvanometer, then the galvanometer can be damaged. The coil could be burnt or something. Then, how do I? So, I, I have very limited use uh, for the galvanometer to measure the value of current like this. But is there a way where I can I can I can improve the range over which the galvanometer can measure current? Right now, it can measure current from zero to twenty microamperes. Can I make it? to measure current from, say, 0 to 10 amperes. Should I go for a new design? Another galvanometer, you know, which can handle 10 amperes. But that's, that's going to be costly, okay? Uh, particularly for DZ, then it's, it's too much. Uh, it, it's not needed. It, it, there is no need for you to go for a new design. You can still use the same galvanometer which can allow only 50 microamperes through it to measure more current in the circuit. So that is what we are going to see now. Let's do this. I have this circuit V. And let's suppose that I've connected the galvanometer. So this is the internal resistance of the galvanometer. I call this as RG. And that is this resistance R. This could be an appliance, anything. So this is our the load resistor. Okay. So this is my I. So this is I in the circuit. But now this I could be say four amps. Clearly, I cannot connect my RG, the, the galvanometer here. If I connect the galvanometer here, then I will be in trouble. Because it can allow only 20 microamperes, but now this circuit will have, say, 4 ampere flowing through it. So I will be in trouble. So what should I do? What I should do is that I should somehow, I, 
you know, I should, I should allow a maximum of only 20 microamperes to flow through the galvanometer and the rest I need to bypass. I need to provide an alternative path for the total current. And, and if the current which flows through the galvanometer is some way related to the total current in the circuit, then I can say I will be able to decide what is the total current in the circuit if I know the current in the galvanometer. Let, let's, let's do it this way. Okay. I'm going to provide now an alternative path. All right. So this is the alternative path. I'm, I'm keeping a shunt, shunt resistance. If you're connecting something in parallel to another thing, then it's called as the shunt connection. So the, I've shunted the galvanometer here. So this is shunt. So we call this as shunt resistance. So I have a shunt resistance here. So now the current from the battery comes here and breaks here as IG, current which flows to the galvanometer, and then this would be IS, the current through the shunt resistance. Okay, now, so what do we know? So one thing I know is that I is equal to IG plus I, yes, that I know. That is one thing I know. And what's the other thing I know? The other thing I know is the potential difference between this point and this point. I call this as A, I call this as B. The potential difference between these two points okay, can be given by this expression. So B, AB can be given by Ig into Rg, Rg, and that is also equal to Is into Rs because I pair Rs. So that is the second thing I know. Because you connected the two resistors in parallel, I mean one is the galvanometer, anyway. the other one is the, the shunt resistance. Since you connected both of them in parallel, the voltage drop across them must be the same. So I know that IG or IG RG is equal to IS or S. What is IS? IS can be written as I minus IG. I minus IG. So now I've got IG, RG. So then you talk, no, arrange things on the one side. IG, RG plus RS equal to I to RS. So now IG is equal to RS by RG plus RS into I. Well, RS is a constant because once you connect to the shunt resistance, you're not going to change it. So, RS is a constant. RG is a constant again. So, this term is a constant. Now, with that, well, IG is proportional to I. So, I is the current in the circuit. So, I comes here, then I goes through this. It's like that. So if I is the current flowing through a circuit, then the amount of current which is going to flow through the galvanometer is proportional to the current. And the constant of proportionality is this. That's a profound thing, if you think about it. Because using this, I can theoretically use this galvanometer to measure any range of currents. 
Okay, if I know all I need to do is that I need to get the appropriate resistance to connect in parallel. Okay, so now let's see. Here like I said like four amperes is flowing. Let us suppose that I want my galvanometer to give full deflection when the current in the circuit is 10 amperes. Okay. So, then what should be the value of my resistance, RS, the shunt resistance? What I'm saying here is this. My I, IG max is equal to Rs by Rg plus Rs into this I max. Okay. This Ig max I have no control because you know once the galvanometer is designed, then it can take only a maximum value of current. That's 20 microamp. That's fixed. Can't do anything over it. That's that's instrument I have. So this is going to be 20 micrograms. 20 into 10 to minus 6 amps. Rs I don't know. And Rg, I said it's 50 ohms. Plus Rs. It's okay. the basic stuff. Now look at this, I max. I max I can choose anything. Okay, suppose I want my galvanometer to measure from 0 to 10 amps. So for 10 amps, when the, when the current through the circuit is 10 amps, my galvanometer is going to show the full scale deflection. That doesn't mean the 10 amps is going through the galvanometer. What it means is that when 10 amps flows through the circuit, then 20 microamps flows through the galvanometer. When maximum current flows through the circuit, then maximum current flows through the galvanometer. Okay, so now this I max, if we take, this is 10 amps. 10. So, note here, I, can, I should be able to find the RS value using this. So suppose I get some, some value for orders. Like if you saw this equation, then I'll get the value for orders. Okay. So what it means now is that I take the same galvanometer, which can allow only 20 micrograms, and if I connect this value of orders, which I figure out from this, I'm not going to do it now, but you can figure out to yourself. Okay. If you find this value of orders, then if you, if you take that resistance and connect it across the galvanometer. Now, the galvanometer will show full scale deflection when 10 amperes is flowing through the circuit. Now, only 4 amperes is flowing through the circuit. So now the galvanometer will show only 40% of the deflection. So, this way, even though the galvanometer can allow only 20 microamperes, you can make it measure more current. I hope this is clear to you. Okay, likewise, if you want to use a galvanometer as a voltmeter, you can do that too. What you would do now for that is if you have voltage, if this is the voltage you want to measure, or the voltage of the battery, then you have a series resistance. Okay, and then you connect the galvanometer here. The galvanometer will have the galvanometer resistance. So then what will happen is that this voltmeter will send the current through the galvanometer. Okay. So based on the current that goes through the galvanometer, then the needle will deflect. And again, the full scale deflection will happen when 20 microampere 
uh, I mean, the, the galvanometer that we have taken. Uh, as an example, we said 20 micro ampere flowing through this galvanometer will give us full scale deflection. So, if you want to find full scale deflection, then you need to send 20 micro amperes through this. Okay? So, this is the galvanometer current, IG, I call this as IG. Okay? So, the current which flows through the uh, series resistance will also flow through the galvanometer. Uh, so, this is the maximum allowed current to get full scale deflection. Okay. So, you, this is how you calculate the, uh, the value of the uh, series resistance we need to connect to this. The series resistance is used uh, to limit the amount of current flowing through it. For example, if this is say 100 volts and if this is 50 uh, ohms again, then if you directly connect it without a series resistance, then what will happen is that it will send 2 ampere current through the galvanometer, which the galvanometer cannot handle. You know, you will damage the instrument. So, uh, you are going to have a series resistance. That resistance is RS. It will be, uh, and this resistance is used to limit the amount of current that flows through this. So, if uh, say 100 volts is the maximum voltage that you want to measure, you want to create a voltmeter which has 0 volt uh, to 100 volt range. So, if 100 volt is the maximum voltage that you want to uh, measure, then when 100 volt is connected here, then 20 microamperes should flow through this galvanometer. Okay, uh, so so what will so what will happen is this. If now current I G is equal to V divided by R S plus R G. So this is the the general equation now, right? Okay. This has to be. 20 microamps for full scale deflection. So, if you want to find, if you, if you want to create a voltmeter which has 0 as the uh, 0 to say 10 volts as a range, then when it is 10 volts, then the galvanometer should show me full scale deflection. So, when there is 10 volt connected here, then the current through the galvanometer has to be the maximum current that is allowed. Uh, in this case, it is 20 microamps. They can the galvanometer that we have taken is 20 microamperes. So if this is 20 microamperes, 20 microamperes, and if this is say 100 volts, okay, or uh, whatever you want, okay, then Rs plus Rg, you know, the, the resistance of the galvanometer, so Rs plus 50 is a total resistance. So from this you must be able to find the Rs. Okay. Uh, so you take that, you take it, that resistance and connect it across this, then you will be able to get full scale deflection for 100 volts. If it is uh, any other voltage here, say maybe 50, then you will have kind of like half scale deflection, 25, one fourth of a scale stuff. Usually it is a very high resistance, so you will tend to ignore this 50 ohms. This will be in, uh, in, in kilo ohms or mega ohms, so when you compare that with just 50, then you can ignore it. So, almost a linear scale would be available for you. So, this is how you convert uh, a galvanometer into an ammeter or uh, a voltmeter. So, to convert a galvanometer into an ammeter, you have to connect the resistance in parallel, and the resistance value will be small. Okay. And if you want to convert a galvanometer into a voltmeter, then you will connect a series resistance to the galvanometer. And the resistance value will be high. Okay. The reason is that for uh, the galvanometer, you need to bypass most of the, the current. You can only allow microamperes in the galvanometer. The rest of the current should go through another part. So the resistance that you connect has to be small. Because only for low resistance, more current will flow. But 
here you have high resistance because you are trying to limit current through the galvanometer. So when you use galvanometer as an ammeter, a small value of resistance will be connected in parallel. And when you use a galvanometer as a voltmeter, then a very high value of resistance will be connected in series. Hope this is clear to you. With that, students, we have come to the end of this lesson. So I would like to do a brief summary of what we have done in this lesson. Basically, there are only two parts to this lesson. One is the part where we talk about moving charges in an external magnetic field. So what happens to a moving charge when it is kept inside an external magnetic field? It's going to experience a force and that is given by the Lorentz force equation. Okay? Uh, QB cross B, the force experienced by it is given by F is equal to QB cross B. And the second part was about the moving charge creating its own magnetic field. And that was given by Beaux-Savart's law and the Ampere's circuit law. So Beaux-Savart's law is equivalent to Coulomb's law in electricity. Likewise, Ampere's circuit law in magnetism is equivalent to the Gauss's law in electricity. So there are basically these two parts to this lesson, and everything else revolves around these two parts. And once we came across these, Lorentz force, Beaux Savart's law, and the Ampere circuit law, and we talked about the force between two current carrying conductors. Uh, we took an infinitely long, uh, two infinitely long conductors, and then we calculated the, the, uh, the force experienced by them, either the force of attraction or uh, repulsion experienced by those two current carrying wires. That's obvious. Because if one uh, current carrying wire is going to behave like a magnet, the other current carrying wire will also behave like a magnet. So when you have two magnets, then the force of attraction or repulsion will take place between them. So we, we did that. And then we defined ampere from that perspective. And once we defined ampere, we said Coulomb could be redefined in terms of ampere second. So I mean the, the charge, the electric charge, Coulomb, can be defined as 1 ampere second. And that is what you use in uh, SI uh, units. And once this was done, we talked about the electric dipole moment. We said if we take a current and if we make it flow through a loop, then it constitutes an, a, a, a magnetic dipole. So we calculated the magnetic dipole moment of this current carrying loop. We said this M is equal to N into I into A. So where A is the area of the loop and I is the current flowing through the loop and N would be the number of closely wound turns in the coil if you take. Um, so we talked about that. And once we define this magnetic mo moment this way, then we realized that an electron could be treated as, a, as an electric dipole, an electron an atom. When it is revolving around uh, the nucleus, then it is in a loop. So if it is in a loop, and if it is moving in one direction, you can consider the current to move in the other opposite direction, but then the current is also moving in a loop. So then clearly, this must have uh, an electric dipole, uh, sorry, magnetic dipole moment. So we calculated the, the magnetic dipole moment of a revolving electron in an atom uh, and we, we came across what is called as a Bode magneton uh, and we had its value to 9.274-64. So that's we, we, we ampere meter square. So we came across it to a very small amount but then you still have it. Uh, an, an atom behaves like a magnet. Okay, in that perspective. Uh, so we came across that. And once we did this, then we talked about the moving coil galvanometer, which is 
to put all that we have learned in practice, uh, or the theory that we have learned, now becomes the, the uh, becomes a practical equipment that you can use. So there, the moving coil gamma metal had only coil, and kept between the poles of a permanent magnet, and if pass current through the coil, then the coil will start oscillating, start moving, will experience a torque because of the arrangement and stuff. And uh, we found that this uh, oscillation could be stopped with the use of a spring. So if you have a spring, then it will deflect and stop. You don't allow it to keep moving back and forth. But then the spring will, will pull it back, pull the coil back from, from, from moving. So at some point, then the torque uh, on the coil, due to the, uh, the, the, uh, the force experienced by the current flowing through it, and, uh, and the spring, uh, the, the torque provided by the spring would match at some point. Okay? And that, that, is the, that will give you a measure of the current flowing through the coil. We say phi, the angle of deflection will be proportional to the current flowing through the, the coil. And we also talked about how to convert uh, a galvanometer into an ammeter and a, um, and a voltmeter. A galvanometer straight away can handle only a few microamperes of current. So if you're going to connect it in a circuit, you can, uh, so long as the current is very low in the circuit, you can use the galvanometer as an ammeter itself. But usually our circuits will have much more current than just a few meters. So in that case, you cannot directly connect a galvanometer. There. So you have to bypass most of the current, most of the current in the circuit through a shunt resistance. You will have a low resistance, we connect it in parallel to the galvanometer so that most of the current will be bypassed, only a bit of current will flow through uh, this galvanometer. And there is a relationship you can establish between the current which flows through the galvanometer and the total current in the circuit, which is again a linear. So you can recalibrate the same galvanometer. For, to measure different values of current. Even though when the microamperes flow through the, uh, the galvanometer, uh, the amount of current that flows through the galvanometer depends on the amount of current which flows in the circuit. So you can, you can, you, you can make an ammeter out of a galvanometer like this. And if you take a very high resistance and if you connect it in series with the galvanometer, then you, you, you make a voltmeter out of it. Because this high resistance is going to limit the amount of current that is going to flow through this galvanometer because of the voltage source. Uh, so, uh, which range you want to measure the voltage depends on what value we are going to have for the resistance, the external resistance. Uh, likewise, which range you want to have your galvanometer to measure the current uh, depends on on, on the, the, the value of the shunt resistance you have, the parallel resistance you connect with the galvanometer. So these are the uh, two things that we uh, uh, talked about when we uh, came across the galvanometer. Uh, and and that's, a, that's about it as far as this lesson is concerned. It, it can, it's, it's a very, uh, this is a very quick summary of this lesson. And the rest are all details. If you can, if you understand the lesson well, then it, it, there is nothing in the lesson basically. It's a very easy lesson if you understand it. So go through the videos, and if you have any questions, doubts, clarifications, if you require any clarifications, you reach out to me, and I will respond to you. So I consider this lesson to be complete. In the next video, we will take the next lesson.